is a two-time Pan Am Games gold medalist, a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, a three-time Olympian, and now Diane jones Konohowski can add honored member of Canada's Sports Hall of Fame to her long list of accolades. Diane joins me now from her home in Calgary. Diane, congratulations. How did it feel to get the call to this hall? Well, I was truly honored. I was really surprised because I really felt that I wasn't going to make this hall. I've been to, named to every other hall, but uh, I sat on the selection committee, Tara, for many years. So I know how difficult it was just to get nominated and then to get chosen. And um, yeah, so when I got the call, I was really surprised, but truly honored. So we'll touch on your remarkable career. I'd like to start from the beginning because most of us struggle to excel in uh, a sport, an event. Pentathlon is five. So how did you become a pentathlete and get to such a high level? Well, I just always did sport right from when I was five. I did gymnastics. I did uh, baton twirling. I, um, uh, I did volleyball. I played a lot of volleyball, all the school sports, and I just needed to be busy. I think I liked phys ed and sports better than school academically. So I was just always really, really active. So when I did get involved in track and field, now known as athletics, um, it was sort of natural for me to, to participate and train for a number of events within the sport. And there were some competitions that I would go in 10 or 11 events. Um, so it just seemed that the pentathlon was a natural for me. So fast forward to uh, 1979, heading into 1980, you are in peak form. You are at the top of the sport. Um, you've gone through two Olympic games, heading into your third, and the rug gets pulled out from under you. 1980, Canada decides to boycott that games. Um, first of all, that wasn't a decision that you were in support of at, at the time. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to you in retrospect, knowing that you were positioned to win gold that year? Well, at the time it was very, very upsetting because I had just come off 1978, the Commonwealth Games gold medal with the number one score in the world. And uh, 1979 was another successful year. So I was really heading into Moscow, a real podium favorite, right? A contender. Um, we had moved to New Zealand, my family and my coach's family, and we isolated ourselves. And I remember watching on my American athletes marching on the White House, um, trying to get President Carter to change his mind. And I remember saying to my husband, I can't. I can't imagine how they're feeling. <laughs> and then, you know, literally a month later, I get the call from um, Corey Elliott in Edmonton, CFRN, and he says, what do you think about Canada's decision? And uh, we were way out of the loop. We were in New Zealand, and you got two uh, news um, channels and TV, and we had no idea what was going on in Canada. So I spoke out against it. And to this day, I believe that it was a, a really wrong decision. It didn't prove anything. Um, but it was a very um, interesting time and I, I was obviously very, very disappointed because those were my last Olympics. That's when I wanted to sort of, sort of get on with my life and um, sort of start, um, I guess, looking at reality and, and getting a mortgage, getting a, you know, a house and having children and all that kind of stuff. You kind of put that, that on hold when you're an athlete pursuing the Olympics. So. Two weeks after you were supposed to compete, though, you did compete against all of those you would have mm -hmm. competed against at the Olympic Games, and you beat everybody. Did that provide any solace to you, or it's still stung just the same? Well, a little bit. I mean, um, yeah, I, I did beat them, and I also won the alternate Olympics, which is what the Americans called their games. They were so funny down there, but um, <laughs> it was like the Olympics when you won and crossed you, the, the media just kind of swarmed. But um, it's the American way, right? But um, yeah, I mean, it, Tara, it's not really about the hardware at the end of the day. You know, um, you ask many athletes where their medals are and they're in drawers somewhere in a sock. They're very rarely are they on display. So it's more really about the journey. So I knew that <clears throat> my performance was really good and I knew that I probably could have gone on the podium. Um, and, you know, it's, um, it didn't happen and, and that's fine. I have to be very happy with the training that I did <clears throat> and uh, the results that I did um, achieve in 78, 79 and 80. Well, that no doubt gave you incredible perspective uh, when you took your life off of the, the track, off of the field. Um, but one strange distinction you have is having missed 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, you share a lot with a bunch of these Olympians this year who were supposed to go to Tokyo and have now been 
uh, had their dreams postponed. Have any of them come to you and, and asked for advice? And, and No, I'm, I'm way too old. <laughs> I'm kind of the past, but I, I do feel for them because yeah. so many of those athletes and coaches, this is really their swan song, right? This is, this is it. They, they want to, they've done it. They've been there, done that. They've got some goals. They want to achieve them and then they want to kind of move on in life. So this is really tough for those athletes. It's sort of at the end of their career. Do they hang in another year? Um, and then we're hearing from the CEO of the um, organizing committee that they may not even happen. Um, that's not good news either. So we'll just have to see how it uh, plays out. But um, globally, it's a very tough decision, but everyone's in the same boat. And mm -hmm. no athlete wants to go to a game anywhere, Tara, where you can't train, you can't be right. prepared. And nobody can prepare right now. So it's a very frustrating time for everybody. You talked about your transition and uh, it seemed very seamless. You, you remained in the world of sport until 2010. Mm -hmm. um, how, what did you take? What lessons did you take with you and, and how did you apply them to life? Also working with athletes. Well, I think just having been there and just, I just know what the journey's like. And I also coached and, um, you know, you just have that, all that experience of traveling the world and learning more about yourself in terms of your potential and how far you can push yourself. And you meet with a lot of coaches from around the world and you just gain a lot of knowledge. Um, and so for me, it was easy to work with athletes um, after, after sport, also to sort of sit on a couple of national committees. It was natural for me to sit on the Coaching Association of Canada committee at a time when the National Certification Program was asking of our coaches to get themselves certified, to go back to the classroom, to learn more about coaching, get, gain that knowledge. And we were starting to um, look at um, wanting to do better on the international uh, stage, right? And so we wanted our coaches to be right up there with us. And then when I was on the, the Canadian Olympic Committee for many, many years, um, in the 90s, we were looking at making those tough decisions about not being able to fund every sport. You know, we just didn't want to go to the Olympics anymore and participate. We actually wanted to get to the podium and win. So we had to make some really tough decisions about selecting those sports and athletes that we felt could really you know, perform well. And I was always also the first employee of, our, of Canada's first national sports centre. And that was an exciting time. So it's really fun to be a part of these decisions because you're creating something new. And it's all about excellence. It's all about supporting our athletes and getting them to the podium. And what does that look like? What do we have to do? So really enjoyed that part of the journey when I was on my national boards. Do you see yourself as a role model, particularly for women? Yeah, I'm, I'm told I was. I mean, I still get, get, you are, you um, are. I still get people coming up, women coming up to me today that, yeah, because in the 60s, when I started, my, my career spanned three decades, you know, the mid 60s, right through to uh, 1984, when I chose to retire and not go to the LA Olympics. Um, and I, I have women that come up to me and, and there weren't that many in those days, uh, women role models. And I was in the paper a lot. The media really liked me. So I was in the newspaper a lot and in the media a lot. And um, yeah, I guess I was a role model for so many women. And um, yeah, and, and uh, looking back, um, you, at the time that you're going through that, Tara, you, you don't think about it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really sort of near the end when people come up to you and say, oh gosh, I admired you so much. You were the reason why, you know, uh, I pursued my sport and that always makes you feel good. Well, I'm going to correct one thing if I may, because you're talking about the past tense, but you are an incredible role model. So please oh, own you. that because you really, you are what we call a, a kick-ass <laughs> woman. So yeah. please, please. And I'm, I'm delighted that we get to highlight you again uh, with this induction. I'm gonna leave you with one final question because I know the work you're doing currently is very important at the Distress Center in Calgary. So um, what is that and how has the need been amplified by the pandemic? Well, Distress Center Calgary is Calgary's only 24 hour crisis support. And so um, we're very busy right now, absolutely. We, we take over after hours when all social agencies and, and um, really the, um, 
preventative health care sector kind of closes its doors, right? And we do very important work. We literally save lives every day, for sure, um, every day. And my role is fund development and communication. So it's the awareness piece, getting the word out that we exist. We're there for anybody. They can call us at day or night. Um, they can chat if they don't feel comfortable talking on the phone. And youth can actually text. And at the other end of that text is another youth. We're the only texting support program in Canada, peer support program. And so it's really valuable work. Um, the fund development is, is tough right now. Everyone's yeah. in really um, financial need. So it's really, really tough out there, but um, it's okay. We have a, a great case for support and we do save lives every day. And I just love working in the social sector. It's very different for me at my age. It's a very compassionate workplace. So um, I love it. It's gonna be my last, my last job and my last career. Well, Diane, you have had incredible careers, plural. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for your time and congratulations on your newest induction. Thank you, Tara.